Hey everybody, I'm Kaylin Kaler. I'm a senior NFL writer for The Athletic. Welcome to QB2, the show where we talk to only my favorite players in football, the backup quarterbacks. The backups are rarely in the spotlight, but here on QB2, we celebrate them and we give them their moment to share their knowledge and stories with us. QB2 is also a very loose term because these guys in this role are regularly shifting up and down and up and down the depth chart as their careers go on. And today's guest knows that roller coaster very, very well. As a high school senior, he was the number one quarterback in the nation. He had 18 Division I offers, but after a tumultuous college experience, he went undrafted. He signed with the Panthers as an undrafted free agent in 2018. And while he was there, he ended up starting 13 games for injured Cam Newton and Taylor Heineke. He became a big story in 2019 when he won four straight games in relief of Cam. He started four more games as a member of the Washington football team, and he's now in his fifth NFL season, his first in Houston, backing up Davis Mills. Welcome to the show, Kyle Allen. It's a the long intro right there. That's a long story. You got it pretty good. Thanks for having me. Listen, you've had a long career. You know, you've had a, it's you know in, in terms of years, not that long, but a lot has happened in that time. A lot. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Happened. So as I mentioned in sort of the intro, the title of the show, QB Two, it's loose, right? Mm -hmm. Um. You know, you are QB2 right now. You've been a QB1 in the past. You probably will be a QB1 again at some point in your future. Um, so I've had guys that I've approached to do this show who have said no because they don't view themselves as backups. They, they just don't even like the term QB2. So I'm curious for you right now, at this point in your career, like how do you see yourself? How would you describe, you know, what your, you know, your career in this moment? I mean – kind of interesting you say that i mean i've been qb4 yeah. i've been qb3 i've been one i've been two i mean it's just the seasons of life like you're in different spots you're in different scenarios like right now i'm the qb2 and i think right now my job is to be ready when it's my time to play and to help davis a young really talented quarterback get ready to play on sunday and i think each team and each situation you're in you have a certain job title that's not really on paper but you know what you got to do to help the team win and i think being a quarterback, no matter if you're the one, the four, whatever. I mean, I was, I remember I was a quarterback three my rookie year as a practice squad guy. And I was yep. just, how, how can I help the team win? You know, just try and find ways to be valuable and help the team win. So you have a, a job and it's whatever job you make it. And it really doesn't matter the label, you know, but right now it's, I guess it's QB2 as the show states. Yeah. Yeah. So I talked to my last guest was Charlie Whitehurst, who, you know, you mm. might know by the nickname Clipboard, Clipboard Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. yeah. He not? he had a really interesting um, perspective. Like he said, by the time he got to his like seventh or eighth season, you know, he kind of realized like, all right, I'm not going to be that, you know, franchise quarterback making the huge, huge contract. Like that's not in the cards for me. And he said it allowed him to play really free mm -hmm. for the rest of his career. When he got chances to play, he was like, this is fun now. Like I'm having a good time. So I wonder, um, have you gotten to that point or are you still in the mindset of like, I'm striving, I have that in me, it's coming for me? I think, to Charlie's point, I think the further along you get in your career, the more you kind of solidify yourself to yourself and to the league, like you solidify yourself as a player, the more tape you get out there, the more games you play, the more you can just start to say, F it and just play your game and do your thing and within yeah. reason obviously i think right. charlie, charlie, as charlie got older clipboard jesus came along you almost yeah. become a character you know but yeah i think the more you play and and the farther you get along in the league you realize that your time in the league is short so whenever you get that chance you got to leave it all out there and just be you and play your game and and whatever's going to happen is going to happen i've had fantastic games i've had horrible games and all of them in between you know so you, it's whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen and you just prepare yourself to play and then when you go out there play as free as you can because you talk to any quarterback when you're playing free and you're playing your game that's when you're playing your best mm -hmm. so I usually I usually don't get into college career as much um on this show but yours is so interesting because of you know the way it went versus mm -hmm. all the ways that it could have gone based off of you know how highly recruited you were um so you know you you end up at AM Kyler they bring in Kyler Murray you both end up transferring after that year after they bounce back and forth between the two of you. You go to Houston. The coach you went there for isn't even there when you finally get to play. So you end up deciding to go to the NFL, foregoing your last season of eligibility. You didn't have a ton of college tape to go off of. What made you feel like you could make an NFL career at that point? Like, was that a huge risk for you? Yeah, I mean, it was a huge risk. But my thinking was – 
at that point in my career at Houston, it was my fourth year. The situation I was in, the people I was around, the, the coaches I was around, I just felt like if I was to stay another year, and the, that year I got benched, so I didn't play the last nine games, you know? So right. it's either like, do I stay here and try and win out the job that I just got benched in, or do I transfer again? Which transferring is just like, it sounds great, and then you do it, and it's it's a hell of a lot worse. Than, it actually you know. sounds terrible to me. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it sounds like, you know, like the grass isn't always greener, you know? Yeah, right. But, and then the third option is like, I always felt like I had the ability to play in the NFL. I always felt like I had the skill set. I was good enough. I was confident in myself enough, no matter what the situation was. So I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to try and go. I, I figured I was going to go undrafted I didn't expect to get drafted. I'm going to do as much as I could from January to April to show teams or do whatever. And then hopefully get an opportunity to show myself. And then when I got picked up by Carolina, I was the four. It was Cam Newton, Taylor Heineke, Garrett Gilbert, and then me. I got like six reps all of OTAs, you know. I like, And it was just like, a, oh, Kyle hasn't played in a while. We should probably get him in there for some reps, you know. It was like one of those things. And then I didn't play in a preseason game until the last preseason game. of It was the fourth one, the second half. Thankfully, we were down by a ton of points. So we threw it like 30 times and I played great. And so that kind of just got me an opportunity to be on practice squad. And I even get it. I got cut the next week from practice squad and I ended up getting bring back, but yeah. I'm sure we'll get into all that. But I think when you look at my journey from college after college football to this point, it's just all about taking advantage of opportunities. I wasn't going to ask you this, but something you just said made me think about it. You said, you know, it wasn't until the last preseason game that you even get a shot. Mm -hmm. Now there's one less preseason game. Mm -hmm. um, do you think guys are, do you think that's detrimental to guys like you who maybe aren't getting as many opportunities as they could have? Yeah, I think, I think it goes both ways. I think it hurts some of the, the bubble guys. It hurts some of those guys that yeah. may not be getting a chance, but also some teams, the way they're setting it up, their guys are just playing less in preseason and they're still playing all those guys. So it really just comes down to like who your coach is. Like mm -hmm. the Rams, the Rams don't play anybody in preseason, you know? Right. So their guys, their guys are playing the whole preseason. So they got the whole opportunity, but right. on places they play their stars a lot. So, I mean, I, it's more situation, but there's less games. There's less reps to, to throw around, but there's not that mid camp cut anymore. So you the guys are there most of camp. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. You mentioned, you know, you get six reps during OTAs that year, which is obviously like nothing. Um, is there, is there any way, obviously there's only a certain number of reps and there's a certain number of quarterbacks. You got to split it up. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to, you know, find those extra reps for guys at the bottom of the depth chart, but can you ever ask for reps? Like, is that allowed or is that like, eh, don't do that? I mean, <laughs> so in training camp that year, I was the same situation. I hadn't gotten a rep in like a week and a half. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm not a guy to be like, coach, why are you playing me? Like, what's the deal? Like, yeah. So I just go back to my dorm room at night and I text my agent and I was like, hey, I haven't got a rep in like 10 days. Like, should I go say something or <laughs> like, what's the deal? And then he like humbled me and he was like, you got to realize like, you're the fourth quarterback. You're the least of their worries right now. And I was yeah. like, Damn, you're kind of right. I was like, be a little selfish, but you just got to, hopefully you just wait for your opportunity and coaches are good about giving guys opportunities for the most part. And it's like I said, you just, it might be one opportunity. You got to take advantage of it when it comes. So do you have like a mental uh, tracker? You're like, okay, it's now been six days. Okay. Now it's seven. Like well, how do you. Hopefully. I mean, thankfully it doesn't happen much anymore. I'm getting a little bit more rest <laughs> yeah. nowadays, but yeah. back then it was like a, all right, am I going to be able to show anything here or what? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I wanted to ask you, you mentioned this, you know, they, the Panthers, you're there, you're undrafted free agent, you're KB4, they end up releasing you. Um, and you've told this story before, but you saw Connor Cook, who is another quarterback mm -hmm. in the elevator at your hotel. And you're like, oh no. <laughs> and, then, and then you get released. So yeah. when they release you, I know a lot of times with these, you know, you could call it fringe quarterbacks, the QB4s, QB3s, who are kind of up and down practice squads, getting claimed, released, um, all of that. A lot of times teams end up bringing them back. It's just kind of a procedural thing. When the Panthers released you at that point, did they say anything to you like, hey, you know, stay ready. We're going to bring you back later. Was there any kind of communication like that? Yeah, I mean, so after training camp, they released Garrett from because they were going to keep one active backup and then 
they wanted me on practice squad. And then you know how that goes after training camp. They, everyone else gets cut around the league, and then coaches get a, a chance to see who else is around. And Connor Cook was a guy who had started a, um, a playoff game a couple years back. Mm-hmm. Like great, but had experience, you know. And so when he hit the wire, I think they were just – they wanted to see what he had. That was essentially what they told me. They were like, hey, it's nothing against you. We just, like, want to see what he has. He has a little bit more of a track record. Like, and obviously it was like a stay ready. Like, we might bring you back. I mean, I feel like you'd say that to everybody. Yeah, know? yeah. It's no skin off their back to say that to you. But, I mean, when I got cut, I didn't hear from them until Cam started having shoulder issues later in the year. Yeah. They, Connor came. I guess Connor didn't play super well. And so he was released only a couple weeks after that. And then they had two quarterbacks for most of the season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And when that happens, like you mentioned, like, you know, Connor hits a waiver. Um, are you, I mean, I'm sure now as, and as a QB2, you might pay less attention to this stuff, but like, do you keep a, an eye on that around the league of like, who's I see getting everything. released? <laughs> I see everything. I'm on it. <laughs> How do you I'm, do it? I just love it. I don't know. I'm on it. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Schefter. I'm on PFT. Like, yeah. I all the QB news I'm on it and me and if you've seen the clip of me talking yeah. about Connor me and Jordan Palmer we have a, a show too where we talk all things quarterback called the room so yeah. we're all, we're on top of all that stuff too that's awesome do you have like alerts set up for every time like Schefter or don't need it. I'm just on my phone all the time I'm addicted <laughs> to my phone so I'm on it. that's amazing that is amazing you could make a good agent someday you know with yeah, all this knowledge maybe. <laughs> so uh, going back to Carolina um I will never forget the first time I have ever saw Cam Newton in person. I think it was like training camp of probably 2015. Mm-hmm. I was just stunned. Like his physique. I just, you know, you, you see right away why his nickname was Superman. Mm-hmm. So what was your first impression of Cam Newton? Man, the thing about, I mean, obviously like he's physically insane, but he's also just like a really intimidating person. <laughs> And he loves to, like, get in your head and, like, ask you questions that make you really uncomfortable, especially new guys. Like, any new guys, he just tries to make you super uncomfortable. And so I just remember, like, my first couple weeks in that quarterback room, like, I was just, like, like <laughs> waiting for him to say some shit to me. And, like, I was just trying to, like, say the right answer. And I well, that was, like, the uncomfortable thing. But then, like, that just under like he is just one of the funniest dudes ever. Like I started to understand his humor and get along with it. And me and Cam got along awesome. Like Cam made football fun again for me. Like college, like you read off my college career. College is yeah. for me. Yeah. And then being able to be in that quarterback room and not have to play right away and kind of sit back and and learn from a lot of like awesome vets on that team too. Greg Olson, Ryan Khalil, Luke right. Keekley, Cam, like so many good vets just to kind of sit back and see how like how football really is and how much they enjoyed it. Like that was such a good NFL reset for me. Like I just loved football again after that. What was one of like, give an example of something Cam would say to like, he wouldn't in, want me to, he intimidate me to people. No, oh, come on. It's too racy for here. Oh my <laughs> God. Left, left in the quarterback room. Oh, all right. Audience. We can just use our imagination yeah. there. And Cam, Cam, if you're watching, we'll just go to Cam's YouTube channel. You, know. you see Cam. <laughs> yeah. You got some crazy stuff on there. Yeah, that's so true. Um, what did he like? I know different starters around the league. They like their quarterback room set up in certain ways. Um, did he have anything specific that like he wanted his backups to provide for him or to, you know, what was his style? I guess. I mean, I was the rookie, so I was his rookie. So my job was to carry around his briefcase everywhere, or, like his backpack <laughs> briefcase, but with his binder. So funny story. Um, when I got re-signed to the team, yeah, like week eight or nine, I think the next week we had an away game, and he always shows up like 30 seconds before the bus leaves to go to the airport <laughs> to get on the bus. And so he was like, my oh, nickname no. was Lovey Dovey there. That's what that's what he called me. And so why? He, that's another story. I'll tell that right <laughs> after this one. But okay, okay. <laughs> he he was like, Lovey, my briefcase is in my locker. It's your job to bring it on the bus and bring it on the plane. So it has like game plan all his notes like super important i get on the bus i forget it (gasps) totally spaced thankfully like he had to go grab something from the locker room oh my god so we had the bus had to wait for him and then he walks up with his briefcase and he just stares me right in the eye goes that is a massive fine that's a huge (laughs) fine and i'm just like 
Oh God. <laughs> And I knew it right when he walked on. I knew exactly what I did. Oh, so. my God. How much did he find you? Do you remember? Well, he knew I was broke, so he didn't actually find me. It was more of a, My signing bonus was like three grand. Yeah, yeah. And I was on Peace Squad, but he knew I was broke. Oh, my God. that That is amazing. And I'm sure it was like a really nice like Louis Vuitton briefcase. or yeah, you know. it was something like that. I, don't know, but it was, I remember it was really important. It had all his notes in there. Wow. Okay. What And what, where did Lovey come from? Lovey came from, I think I stole this story last night. Lovey came from early on in OTAs. Uh, I was coming out to practice one day and we were just all sitting in stretch, you know, the whole team stretching. Greg Olson in front of like the whole team goes like, Kyle, I was on your Instagram last <laughs> night. Like I got like caught. I scrolled like a hundred pictures down oh. and I'm like, oh God. Oh, like, no. what is this? <laughs> and I've been dating the same girl since high school. And he goes, he was like, every single picture of you is you and your girlfriend. Like, every single one. And he's just, like, roasting me in front of the whole team. And I was just like, I was like, screw it. I'm just going to own it. So I was like, yeah, own yeah, it. Yeah. I was like, yeah, like, of course it is. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and so Cam has a nickname for everyone. My nickname after that was Lovey Dovey. Oh, my God. And it, like, caught on to, like, this, the social team for the, like, social media team on the team. Like, anytime they post anything about me, it was, like, the dove emoji with the heart. Like, oh, my God. That was my name in Carolina. Even, like, the fans, too. <laughs> That's amazing. Does anybody still call you that? A couple people do. All my old teammates <laughs> from there do. Like, Greg Olson, when he's calling our games, he sees me. It's always lovey. It's never Oh, my God. Out. That's yeah. so great. I love that. Um, so, I want to talk about – you and I at training camp had a really interesting conversation about Cam Newton's unique cadence. Yep. And um, one of the most important parts of being a backup is to be able to mimic the starter's cadence perfectly. Mm -hmm. Because when you have to come in, you don't want your offensive line to get confused and have any false starts. So, um, you know, can you, first thing I want to start with, can you give us a Cam Newton impression? Well, I know you're going to play the clip after. So I would yeah, yeah. We were play before, <laughs> but all right. You can hear it. I don't want to give away any secrets, but I think Washington – like they still have a similar cadence, at least we had last year because yep. it was just caught on in the same offense. But yeah, so he drags it all out. Like Cam has mat, like huge human, massive lungs. Like he can hold <laughs> it out. And so his whole thing was, and the offensive line knew this. He wants to hold it so like the D line will get on their like toes, they'll like get off balance. And so when he really wants to snap it, they're not on balance. So he goes start. He goes ready. Gets everyone ready. All right, has he got any motions or anything? He sends motion. He goes, what are you? What are you? a lot deeper, obviously, not yeah. that high. But the whole time when he's holding that, that white lady, when he's holding it, he's just well, I had to do it for freaking that whole year. <laughs> yeah. He's looking at safeties, he's trying to get line to jump off. He's just and it was tough to get like new old linemen to actually figure that out because yeah. they're used to like you listen to anyone else kid, it's just what did he? But he said, Hut. and so it like rolls, you know, mm -hmm. it is just, you don't know when it's going to happen. He's just right when he like, basically like right when you go, what did he, and you pause, that's when the ball is getting snapped. You just roll it. I love let's it. Let's see if I did good. If okay. Let's see how you did. Yeah. Let's see how you did. Let's compare it to the real thing. Hopefully it's one where he holds it out. <laughs> and of course, at Auburn, and do a national championship and like Bradford, the number one pick in the NFL draft the year. Nothing really to challenge. Philly thought they had it. They don't. Second down in a long yard. That was good. Spot on. That's pretty on. good. Pretty good. I think you even got pretty deep, too. I know it's hard to sort of imitate the actual, like, uh, sound of someone's voice, but that was pretty good. Yeah, I think um, I had a couple of voice cracks early on <laughs> when I was trying to do it, so that's not good. And you told me uh, a story from training camp where you were struggling uh, and you got taken out of a drill, I think, because you couldn't get it right. Yeah. That was that. that was a little – that wasn't because of the cadence, but that was a nice rookie moment for me. We had an O-line coach who – I mean, just typical O-line coach, like any new guy or rookie, he was just getting on just to be an asshole for better words. Like me and him are in great terms now, but early on he did not like me. I, I went down and like – Basically, the O lineman, D lineman do like one on one pass rush drill. Yeah. You need a quarterback just to do the cadence and stand there. And so he is like, normally you just be like, hey, do it on one, on two, like on first sound. But he didn't want the D lineman to know. So he looks at me like real quick and goes, hey, this is on one, on, on two, on first sound. And he just gives me all these signals. And I was like, what? Okay. I was like, okay. 
and like acting <laughs> like I knew it. I didn't want to ask him. Yeah, right. But he gives me one of them, and I give the wrong cadence. Cusses me out. Gives me another signal, changes it, and I was like, oh, man, I don't know this one either. <laughs> I screw it up, and so he just kicks me out of the drill. Oh, like, no. And then I went back. The, the rest of the quarterbacks are doing seven on seven, and they go, what happened? Why are you here? And I was like, I, just, I got kicked out. I don't know. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, man. It was funny, though. Yeah, and with Cam's, like, as you mentioned, like, his lung power, he's just able to hold that syllable for so long. What did you have to do? Do you remember if you had to do any like breathing exercises or anything to get it right? Nah, I just reps. I just I had to keep doing it and doing it. I was like gas, like by the time the ball was snapped early on. But it's yeah. got like once you figure it out, it is it is good. You just got to get your lineman to hold in there. Yeah, and I, I talked to Taylor Heineke recently, actually. Um, after uh, it was before he was the starter in Washington, but we were talking about the same thing, and he was like, "Yeah, he still does it a little bit, like um." Because mm-hmm. he, he thinks it's helpful. He's like, yeah, yeah, if I see something, if I see the defense change, like I hold it out and, and my lineman will know what that means, you know? Yeah. So yep. it is really interesting. Um, all right. So I want to ask you now um, about, you know, your time coming in for Cam in Carolina. Um, one thing I think I want to know from you that I don't know the answer to is obviously like for us in the media and for fans, like, teams are very secretive about injury injuries and you know, the ser- severity of them and what's really going on. So I wonder for you, when you are playing for cam, I mean, is the team internally pretty candid with you about what's going on with whether it was his shoulder or his foot in 2019? Like, are you kept like close in because it affects your job or is it also kind of equally as, you know, hush hush? I think, you'll probably find this in most teams in general like everything is hush hush it doesn't really mm-hmm. matter who you are like they did like we're gonna disclose as much information as we need to essentially and so for me i think cam had that liz frank sprain in preseason against new england and that's he got hurt in that game and i had to yeah. go in and i was like oh it'll be fine like whatever and because he played he ended up playing week one then win week two right so i thought it was gonna be fun and then he just it just was like hanging on and aggravating him, but he was playing early. And so they were like, okay, um, we're going to give him a little rest. Like you're going to play against Arizona. All right. I was like, okay, great. Perfect. So play against Arizona next week. Yeah. We're still resting him. Like you're going to play against um, who was it? Houston. It was here. Mm-hmm. And then it was kind of like after we won that game, they were like, okay, we're just going to give him to the bye week and then we'll reconvene from there, you know? And then, we win two more games. We get to the bye week. And I remember texting my OC and I was like, what's up? Like, am I going to play the next week or is Cam coming back? And he was like, what do you mean? You're playing next week. And I was like, how am I supposed to know? Like, yeah. No one's telling me anything, you know? And so it was basically like kind of like that until he went on IR. And then okay. once okay. on IR, it was obvious from that point. But I think you were like just with any type of information like that, the teams in general are pretty like hush hush and – which I wish they weren't, but that's just kind right. of this. That's so interesting because it's like, you know, it directly affects you. And I wonder, like, did you at least know, you know, by Wednesday of that week that you were going to be the starter? Yeah, I knew early. Okay. The week. I knew okay. like going in. So like the whole week of practice, I practice. Okay. Like, that's which good. is all the time you need. Right. Really. But right. Long term, I definitely had no clue until yeah. he was on IR. That's, that is so crazy. So mm-hmm. it's really interesting. Like, I feel like every year there's a backup who has sort of like what happened to you in 2019 where you, you have this really, you have a streak of like four super Mm -hmm. good games and then, you know, it doesn't last. It ends up not lasting. Um, You know, uh, this year, I mean, Cooper rush did his held his own in his time this year. Um, And, you know, we're we're kind of seeing maybe Bailey Zappi coming in that, in that range. And I wonder, do you have a name for that phenomenon or like, what would you, what would you call it? Like Mike white last year? Like, what would you, yeah, I think I think it just kind of is like refreshing for everyone in the building. Not to like, oh, like we need a new guy in there to like spice it up. It's just kind of like you got a guy with a different skill set. Like everyone has a different skill set, right? right? You got a guy with a different skill set. Um, usually these guys are playing for their life, you know? Like I was yeah. playing for my life. So you're like maybe just an extra tick locked in defenses mm-hmm. and defensive coordinators don't know exactly who you are yet they don't know exactly what you run so stuff is maybe a little bit more basic 
And then, I mean, some guys are just prepared and ready for it. You know, like Cooper Rush has been around the league for a long time, and I've heard nothing but, like, great things about how smart he is and how good he is at making decisions and how him and Kellen Moore are, like, the two smartest people in that building. And, I mean, Bailey Zappi played a ton last year in college. Through one, You know, like, some guys are just ready for their moment and their opportunity. Yeah. And then I think you also see a lot of times these – things kind of get swept under the rug because it's bad play. But sometimes you see guys who aren't ready for their opportunity and probably didn't want to play on this early on in their career because they're not ready and they don't want to get found out yet. And it's, it's kind of interesting because there's guys that can hang around for a while who maybe aren't as good of players, but they just haven't had to go in and play. You know, they've only had to practice. And then some guys get exposed out there. They're not, they're not ready or they're not built for it. But I think, the more you see the league grow and the more I think it's kind of starts from high school now with yeah. like all the seven on seven and the quarterback development and in college football, like all the a lot of better college football quarterbacks coming out this year, especially. I think the development's just getting a lot better and these these guys are just more prepared to go in and play. And so I mean I think you look around the league, I said this before, you look around the league, there's probably half the league has capable backups that can go in and win games. Mm-hmm. It's so true. And you see teams investing a lot more in the position too. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really interesting as well. So you played for, you know, three different teams now and each of which I would kind of say are struggling to win consistently when you were, when you've been there, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of in formative years for those teams. Um, and each club, like I've had players describe it to me, like each team is like an independent business. Like yep. all of these different teams have their own vibes different owners, different ownership styles. What difference have you seen in the three places that you have been um, as far as like the ownership and how players are treated and just sort of the cultures of the organization? I think for me in Carolina, I don't, I don't think like the ownership, I like, I know owners are all different and you know, the owner, the new owner in Carolina is a much more hands-on and there's owners that are different, like different, but I don't think ownership matters as much to the players day to day as many people think, you know, you're kind mm -hmm. of, just, you're kind of just head down and like with your coaching staff and your players. But for me in Carolina with, with Rivera and all those vets, like I talked about earlier, that was just a great situation and awesome. Mm -hmm. situation. And a ton of those guys that were on the Super Bowl team in 2015. So I just got to learn a ton. Like I was very open to learning, very open to growing I got to learn a ton from a lot of smart guys. North Turner was my OC, like legendary. Like Scott, his son was a quarterback coach, great quarterback coach. I just felt like I grew a ton over those years. Like yeah. I got a ton better and I was around a lot of good bets. And then go to Washington, very similar coaching staff, new mm -hmm. players, different situation for me. I've already played a bunch. I'm kind of the guy on that team that is knows the offense. And so I'm teaching everybody the offense there. And then the ownership was – you know, there's a lot of stuff going on with the team, you know, going on with the training staff when I was there. It was just a lot of yeah. just random stuff, which I think it's blown up more in the media than it is in the building. Like it happens and you're kind of like, oh, wow, that happened. But it doesn't mm -hmm. really affect players on day to day as mm -hmm. much as you'd think. And then here it's my first time not being with Rivera. So a totally different coaching staff, um, new offense, new OC. Um, I didn't know one player on this team when I got here, but. I think it's one of the coolest things is being able to go into a different locker room and meet all these different people and create all these new relationships. It's, it's hard. You got to put in the effort to create relationships, but I think it's so cool. And then being able to see these guys like later in your career on different teams, like that's one of my favorite parts about the league, but um, the ownership here, I mean, the McNairs have been awesome. I think they're around a lot more than I've seen most owners and not mm -hmm. in a bad way. They're around just to be around the team, be around the players, let everyone know they're supported. Um, Hannah and Cal are just super helpful. They do a really good job with the women's group, with like the wives and the fiancés and girlfriends. Like, mm -hmm. from a support standpoint, this is the best I've been around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask you how much sort of ownership drama affects players because obviously you were in Washington when you know those uh, workplace investigations were going on and things like that. Um, did you ever interact with Dan Snyder personally? Only once when I broke my leg, <laughs> he. Um, me and Reuben Foster were going to get surgery in Green Bay at the same mm. time. He let us fly on his plane to Green Bay and back, which was like so nice. Yeah, going through uh, 
airport security with a snap leg did sounded awful. Oh God. Yeah. And so he let us fly on his plane and back. And then like, I saw him in the parking lot, like a week later it was the first time I ever met him and saw him. I just shook his hand and said, thank you. Like really appreciate that. But that was really my only interaction with him. I never had any, like I he had a ton of stuff going on, but that all that stuff, I mean, at least for me, it just never really affected me because I guess it's like, it's going to get itself figured out at some point, something's mm-hmm. going to happen. And either way it happens it's not really gonna affect me like the only thing that i can really control is just trying to win for the team like winning kind of cures everything you know so that's what we were focused on and last thing for you since you have your own youtube show uh with josh palmer or jordan palmer sorry Mm -hmm. and for those of you who haven't watched it it is really interesting you guys so check that out they're talking to it is like the josh allen episode was awesome Mm -hmm. um so since you are now an experienced interviewer what should I have asked you? What question do you want to oh, answer? Oh, you asked some good questions. <laughs> you asked some good questions. I like that you tried to pull a little bit out of me from the quarterback room. I think <laughs> yeah. I think it's it's always good to like walk the fine line of like teeing them up to to say something maybe they wouldn't normally say. Like yeah. that's why like our show we call it the quarterback room. Like I said, like there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the quarterback room that people don't get to see or hear, and like we're in there all day long. And I think some of the funniest conversations happen there. I remember my rookie year when I was with Cam, we were on the Amazon show, All or oh, Nothing. Yeah. yeah. And we had like the camera I'm using right now it was similar. It was in the corner of our room, right? They place all those <laughs> cameras in the corner of the room. And you know Cam, Cam's liable to say anything at anything. any time. So we're sitting in there and I'm like, every time he says something, I'm like, oh, God, like. <laughs> And you'd be, you'll be sitting and we'd be sitting like on a Wednesday night watching film and, you know, you'd be talking, like laughing, saying some, some stupid. And then all of a sudden you look up in the corner and the camera goes, and it would point at you, you know, and you just, and you just stop silent. I mean, you know, someone in some room is over there probably laughing or being like, what the hell are they talking about moving their camera over? Oh so, my God. That's I don't know. Great. I thought you were good. Sorry. I got off tangent there, but no, that's great. Last one for you. This is a quick one. Who is a backup right now that you think needs an opportunity because they are very talented? You know, maybe um, we saw Gino. What'd you say? Well, Gino. I mean, yeah, Gino. Well, yeah, right. I think first one that comes to my mind is probably Gardner. I played against Gardner when he was in Jacksonville, and he's he's a gamer. He's a baller, and he's like, I don't know. I've never been around him. I don't know him at all. I I probably think he's having a hard time being a backup. You know, he's just yep. an absolute like you saw him going in and play last year and how much that meant to him and how well he played. Mm-hmm. And he's a really good player. You know, I mean, that was the year when I was playing as a backup. He was playing as a backup. Mm-hmm. Eddie Bridgewater was playing as a backup. Ton of good. Like I didn't get my spotlight that year. Everyone was playing good. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. But I remember we played him on Jacksonville and he it was a really close game. We ended up winning because McCaffrey ran for like 200 yards that game. But yeah, of course, I think he's a great player. And I think. I was surprised after last year someone didn't take a chance on him. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, Kyle, thank you so much for joining us here on QB2. This was awesome. I could talk to you for hours, but I will let you thank get you. back to your work day. Unfortunately, in I got to go work. <laughs> yeah. I'd rather do this. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for watching.